is Tucker Goodrich, and I am here today with my co-host, Brian Curley, Dr. Brian Curley. Hello, Dr. Curley here. How you doing? And our guest today is uh, Dr. Joshua Durham. Um, Josh, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm a family practice doctor here in Boise. I, I'm an Idaho native. Um, I grew up here and then went to Kansas City and did um, my medical training at and the osteopathic medical school there. And then I did my family practice residency in Kansas City, uh, practiced some rural medicine for four or five years in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, and then moved back home to be closer to family here in Boise. And I work for a big um, group, St. Alphonsus, um, just doing regular general care. So I'll have to uh, caveat the heck out of this. Uh, Dr. Durham, can I call you Josh? Yeah, you call me Josh. Uh, is my GP, um, my brand new GP. Now, this is kind of a funny story. If you want a The Lord Works in Mysterious Ways stories, this is a good one. I got a, I moved to Boise end of 2020, and my wife and I don't, didn't have a GP out here, didn't really need one because we're both healthy, but she has a school requirement that she had to get a note from her doctor. So, Somebody made a comment on my blog in May of last year saying, if you need a family doctor here in Boise, hit me up. And there was no contact information. So I replied to it and nothing happened. And then uh, just probably a couple of weeks ago, um, my wife also works at St. Al's as a nurse in the emergency department. And one of her colleagues came back from her doctor and she said, he gave me this prescription. It says no seed oils. And my wife was like, I want that guy to be my doctor. Well, it turns out it was the same doctor who left the comment on my blog over a year ago. So that is a pretty amazing small world story. And luckily, when my wife went to make the appointment, uh, Josh's office said, oh, no, he's full. He's not taking any new patients. And my ballsy wife said, well, I have to see him. Tell him my husband is Tucker Goodrich and he'll make an exception. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and he did, thank God. And I um, said, I'll take your husband too. <laughs> I know, which, you're, which I'm sure is something you're going to come to regret. And this is nah. probably day one of that. <laughs> yeah, we'll so uh, Josh is actually going to be my GP going forward. And tomorrow morning, I have to go see him in the office and get my uh, initial checkup slash new patient uh confab but I went along with my wife to meet him and he's got a really interesting story and I thought uh, I would we would have him on as a guest um, both uh, Brian and Josh are doctors of osteopathic medicine which in practice and I learned this from Brian and we discussed this a little bit in the podcast number one that we did um, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, it sounds like a chiropractor, which is what I thought it was, but it's really an MD plus. Um, so it's, you get an M, the same training as an MD, and then you get some additional training in osteopathic medicine, which we might get into at some point in this. But both Josh and Brian are practicing on a, as a peer to the medical doctors that they practice with. So I just want to make that clear to everybody that a DO in everyday practice is effectively the same thing or can be, I guess, effectively the same thing as an MD. So you're just a regular family doc in the St. Al's system, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So just tell us, yeah. tell us about, tell us a little bit about your personal health background. Cause that's you, you explained when I was in your office and I thought it was really fascinating. Yeah. And I'll try not to take up too much time doing it, but I was always kind of a sports nut. I, I played football in high school and then I went into uh, amateur boxing and I did golden glove boxing and I worked out like two hours a day. I was I always training. I went to regional and national competitions. Um, and so when I was 28, I finally decided, okay, I better stop doing this. And uh, save those uh, brain cells for your Yeah, I'm career. kind of wishing I would have done it younger, but. <laughs> Anyway, about 28, 29, I transitioned into long distance running just because I always liked to work out. It was always my thing. And so I, I ran six to seven miles a day, six days a week. And it's just kind of what I did. And then all of a sudden, it was almost like it was night and day. I woke up at 38 years old and I weighed 235 pounds. 
and I used to fight at 200 and I was just feeling like garbage. I mean, my joints hurt. I wanted to nap all day. I mean, I would come home from work and try to get a nap in. Um, I still worked out, but it was just like killing me to do it. And I mean, at one point I was texting one of my old internal medicine buddies saying, man, I think I got lupus or something. Cause I mean, my joints hurt, I had brain fog and I just thought, wow, this is what it's like to be 38, you know? And so I, I tried doing everything. I tell my patients like eat less, move more. I was running seven miles in 60 minutes and I couldn't lose weight. And I just kept feeling more and more like garbage, but I was, you know, eating my and, whole grain. And, and, okay. Yeah. That was going to be my yeah, question. I was eating what were you standard, eating? Like, you know, what I tell my, what I would tell my, don't eat saturated fat, don't eat red meat, you know? And uh, anyway, I mean, it just, it just got worse and worse. The more I'd cut calories and work out, the worse I felt. And I, I might've lost like five pounds in like two months and just, just killing myself working out, you know? Right. And then I, I luckily went to a CME conference and Dr. Eric Westman was speaking at it. And he started talking about the ketogenic diet. And uh, it's funny because my wife's a farm D and she was there with me. She's like, oh, this is crazy. You can't No, people can't eat like this because <laughs> we've all been ingrained in this. Like you can't eat meat like that. You can't eat butter and, you know, cream and saturated fat. And so anyway, I was like, yeah, but now and for, for the audience, uh, Dr. Yeah. Westman is at Duke University and is a practicing obesity physician and went up and basically did a fellowship with Dr. Atkins back in the day and took over writing Dr. Atkins diet book. And I actually, I was uh, up at a keto fest in Connecticut a couple of years ago, and I had the pleasure of having dinner with him and everybody else who was there. And I asked him, so I said, I want to know from a guy who's been practicing for a long time doing this, does it ever not work? And he said, yeah, it doesn't work if you don't follow it, but it works in everybody if they follow it. Yeah, and you put the so he's he, he's a great you were lucky to see that particular doctor. Oh, yeah, it was it was amazing. Um but as we'll talk about, it took me a while to really figure out what is it, what does a real keto diet mean? <laughs> because there's an easy there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way, and it took me a while to figure that out. But um anyway, we I decided, all right, I'm gonna try this. And um yeah, I went home from that conference and I lost 20 pounds in four weeks, and it was just melting off of me, and it was like I couldn't believe it. And then after four weeks, I was like and waking up before my alarm clock. I couldn't take a nap even if I wanted to. I just had all this energy. And what did your exercise routine look like? It sucked. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't, Re okay. I couldn't make it past two miles. Like I couldn't run. I couldn't, it took me about eight to 12 weeks to get back up to run in six or seven miles. Cause I, I wasn't, what I figured out is I wasn't fat adapted. So, right. Um, it, it really knocked it down. So I actually lost that weight working out less. I mean, okay. it was, it was crazy. Um, and I remember before doing it, I was always thinking like, what's my next meal? What's my next snack? And just planning all this stuff out. And I tell you what, after about six months of it, it that just stopped. And it's like, I don't even, I don't even think about food anymore. It's really freeing, but that's kind of what got me going on this whole pathway. Um, and so I did your standard keto. The problem was that they don't really explain the whole like good fat, bad fat thing. And that's what it took me another three years to figure out. So now what, what was the impact of that? How did you well, fit? Yeah. Well, so um, I, we, I decided to try the carnivore challenge because it just sounded fun. I had a brother-in-law who was doing it and I felt great on keto. I mean, for me, I could have just kept doing keto the way I was doing it and it wouldn't have been any big deal. Um, and I was maintaining my weight. I was back to working out, doing whatever I wanted. Um, but uh, anyway, I decided to do this carnivore challenge. And after like three or four weeks of carnivore, I was like, wow, why do I feel even better? Like, like my workouts improved. I had all this energy. It was, it was insane. And so I started listening to podcasts on the carnivore diet, trying to figure out, well, what's so much better and what's different about that? Is it really the broccoli or, or not? You right. Know? Uh, but then I saw your interview with Paul Saladino and you're talking about seed oils and I'm sitting there going, Oh my God, that makes sense. And then I watched uh, Brad Marshall and he's talking about, you know, PUFAs and seed oils and all this stuff. And so I realized like, Oh, all that time I was doing keto, I was eating mayonnaise. I was eating blue cheese, ranch dressing. I was eating all these nuts and seeds, almond flour, peanut butter. And I, I was still eating all these PUFAs that are high in omega six. 
And when I cut those out, I felt even better. Um, and did so, you see any body composition changes? Oh yeah, I put on, I, I was able to put on muscle a lot easier and, um, and, and strength, you know, um, which has been, been kind of nice. I mean, I like, I, I literally work out less now than I did when I was training as a fighter and I look better with my shirt off than, than when I used to box. And I was just, and it's just crazy. Yeah. That was one of the things that, uh, Brian noticed as well when he decided he was on a paleo diet, but not specifically avoiding seed oils. And when he added that component in, he saw a big change pretty quickly. Yeah. And so, the, and so it was in like mid, mid January, maybe February, I figured this out. And then all of a sudden I just started Googling like diseases and I'd say, all right, looking for journal articles about omega six to three ratio and hypertension, omega six to three ratio and mental health disease. And I was just like dumbfounded by the number of different scientific articles. And then all of a sudden you're looking and you're like, wait a minute, all these Western diseases have some type of relationship with this abnormal omega six to three ratio. And it kind of, it kind of bugged me. It kind of made me actually almost want to give up medicine because I was like, so my whole career, I've been handing out pills to fight a problem that's coming from the food we're eating. And anyway, it, it was, it was kind of a disheartening time for me. And I had a couple of months there where I just really struggled going to work and, and doing stuff because uh, standard medicine just isn't fun anymore. When you realize, wait a minute, you can cure people. And I've done, and I've had a lot of really good success of stories, which we can get into later if you want, but. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. absolutely. I'd love to do that. So how long, how long ago did you, when, when did you do the carnivore challenge? January of 21. So. And what were you eating? Um, I was eating mostly elk and uh, cause I hunt and um, grass fed beef. Okay. Um, and then. So you were doing it with the best meats possible, basically. Yeah. Uh, with the yeah, best omega-6 to 3 I, ratio I bought possible. a pig. Yeah, I bought a pig from a local farmer who swears they didn't feed it corn and soy, and it was pasture-raised. Um, uh, but I try, I, 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 we buy a, a grass-fed half a cow a year, and, and um, so, and I hunt, and um, actually this last year we got two elk, so I got, I got plenty of good meat. Right, right. That's cool. That's very yeah. cool. And then we then we got chickens because we had to we had to figure out you got to have a you have to know what your chickens are eating so you have good eggs so so that was helpful. <laughs> so you're raising your own chickens. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Kind of fun. Very yeah. interesting. So now tell us. I mean, as I know from my uh, wife's colleague, you're made you've made this a part of your practice. Yeah, I mean, every patient that comes in. Uh, I'm always trying to educate them on nutrition because, um, I, I mean, I, my, my belief is, is we can live to be 90 and still functional and have a good quality of life. And I really think it, it comes down to these kinds of things and, and not having this, uh, abnormal evolutionary omega six to three ratio in our bodies, um, because of the toxicity from the excess omega six. And I, so I just think it's important. I mean, I've, uh, I've seen so much improvement in patients' lives when they, when they cut this stuff out and they, well, they tell, us a, little, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, and so my, my funny, my thing is I say, well, you can eat cow chow and you can look like a cow or you can eat predator chow and you can look like a predator. And I'll tell them, you know, if you want to make a cow fat, what do you feed it? And they'll say, oh, grains, corn, and soy. I go, yeah. All right. So what's going to happen to you if you eat grain, corn, and soy? And it's like, wait a minute, I never thought of that. And it's true, I didn't either. <laughs> and we're in just, just again, for the audience, just to make it clear, Boise, despite the potato thing, is actually a huge beef and dairy state, which, yeah. I mean, when I moved here, we saw cows everywhere, and I don't think we saw a potato plant for six months. So, yeah. um, you know, you got to hunt around for the, at least in this area, there, there are a lot more cows than there are potato plants, at least when you drive around. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks around here in agriculture who get when you say, you know, when you ask them that question, they know the answer and they know exactly what the effect is on the animals. Yeah, but we just don't ever use logic to think, well, what's it going to do to us? You know, right. what happens if I eat that animal that's full of that? You know, it's going to do the same thing to me. So I'm trying to educate my patients and basically teach them, look, you're marbled. You're like that steak that, that's full of all that <laughs> omega-6 fat. 
and you have to get that out of your body and it takes two to four years. It's not gonna, it's not a overnight deal. I mean, it takes a long time to fix that, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be, it can be upwards of what, five years. I think Tucker, you've, you've mentioned that and you've provided. Yeah, if, if you look strictly at the half-life of how long it takes to get omega-6 out of your fat cells, it can take four to five years to get down to an evolutionary level. Yeah, which so, is, but, you know, also when a lot of people who do this long-term like myself or Mark Sisson, comment you know oh it took five years before i started re feeling really great um my liver enzymes took four years to normalize so wow you know that was and they just switched one day one day they were normal and it was like i hadn't done anything so um so, so hold on so i know we wanted to segue into talking like how you talk to your patients sure and um i so i have a, a similar change I, I have a long history of being involved at various levels and learning about ancestral health and my own, you know, waxing and waning um, uh, adherence to the different tenants over the past 14, 15 years or so. But the, but the aha moment with CEDLs was last summer because I just med school in my 30s and residency, I unplugged from that world. I was way too busy. <laughs> but then at, you know, 5'10 and 170 pounds, not obese, not overweight, um, last summer, I was hypertensive. And the, um, uh, the uh, what's it called, the, the, the COVID variant or whatever that hit last summer was real bad at my hospital during residency. And, I'm, and I was like, I need to plug back into this world. So like you'd mentioned with carnivore, I did carnivore because I was like, what's the most strict thing I can think of and did that first. And while doing strict carnivore for about two weeks, I was just delving through all this different stuff. Like you were saying, you know, mm -hmm. back, back into that really, you know, going zero to 60 with a lot of things. And found a lot of Tucker stuff, and um, I like to tell the story because it explains why we're doing a podcast together and why I'm co-hosting here. When I found Tucker talking about seed oils, he was name dropping um, a lot of folks that I was reading ten years ago, or twelve years ago, or fourteen years ago. So we kind of hit this scene around the same time, except for I just went and went to med school and unplugged, and Tucker just became like the walking encyclopedia of everything omega-6. <laughs> I think, I, yeah. I don't think it's fair to say going to med school is equivalent to unplugging. <laughs> Maybe, and I well, wish, no, I am honestly, I, um, I, sometimes I wish I'd done that at that point yeah, in I, my life. I wasn't surfing PubMed or, or really, right. you know, reading long takedowns of the China study or anything like that, like I used to, you know, um, uh, was that Denise Menger? That was, that was beautiful. Denise Menger, yeah. Yeah, that was, it was great. So, um, so we kind of have the we have these these similar but different timeline what I want in terms of our story. And so what I'd like to know, because we want to know what we want people listening to this to get that that perspective and that um that practical in too, how has your elevator pitch changed? And you did mention a little bit, like telling people, you know, you're marbling your fat, you know, some you're using these visuals that help people understand. I'm curious about what your elevator pitch is, and I'd like to share what mine is because okay. people that are listening to this, either I want them to be influenced by the elevator pitch or I want them to be able to adopt that for their own patients or to talk to their doctors. Um, Cause that's, you know, part of what I've been doing with CEDL Disrespector is, you know, how do you change people's minds, right? right. Most right. people don't change their minds with links to PubMed and most people don't change their minds with no. two hour long lectures. It's, it's, it's small hooks that get them interested in things. And sure. it's, you know, and uh, a lot of times it's, trust, you know, trusting somebody that they know, right? Um, and those those thought leaders will look into stuff, but you can really pull in a lot of people. So, I mean, absolutely my, you know, my um, my elevator pitch has changed and I love yeah, to share that. I'm really, I'm really interested to hear you and how that, you know, cause you said you've been practicing for um, many years now, but then yeah. in the past few, you're like, hey, I-, yeah. I, I <laughs> it's a 180. And that, it's a that aha moment is really important because it really is about what is primary prevention and what is primary care? So please share. Yeah. So I think what's so powerful that with when I try to speak to my patients is, is, you know, you can go to a doctor who's always been skinny and always been in shape. And that's one thing. But when you got a doctor standing in front of you that said, look, man, I was fat. I was sick. I needed med I had prediabetes. I had elevated triglycerides, low HDL. I had uh, hypertension, sleep apnea. I needed like four pills based on the guidelines. And I was 38 years old running seven miles in 60 minutes. So right. that's why I tell my patients like, so you're not looking at this skinny guy in front of you today who looks all healthy. 
you got to understand, I went through what you went through. And let me share with you how to get back to being young again, because I feel better now than I do at 42 years old. I feel better now than I did at 16. It's insane. Um, and so then I start to teach them like, all right, let's, let's look at uh, how we used to eat 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And let's look at the difference. And then I'll bring up uh, what I mainly focus with them on now. I mean, I used to always just focus carbs are the devil, carbs are the devil. Not really carbs, carbs are the devil. I don't like sugar. Uh, but we talk now about what's this omega six to three ratio. And I'll show them, I'll say, look, before the 1920s, if you go look at a human population, you're most likely going to find an omega six to three ratio of one to one or two to one. But if you fast forward to today, you've got an omega six to three ratio of 20 to one in Western civilizations or worse. I said, so let's focus on that. Why is that such a big deal? And I'll actually draw this all out and I'll, <coughs> I'll show them like, you know, what happens, what happens to your metabolism? What happens to your body temperature? What happens to your body fat and your liver fat when you eat these omega-6 oils? What happens when you eat saturated fat? And they're like the exact opposite. And so, um, and so, and I'll, and so I'll show them, you know, like, Really, if you want to speed up your metabolism and you want to do better, you got to stop eating all these seed oils, these foods with all these high omega-6, and you've got to try to get back to a normal omega-6 to 3 ratio and not be afraid to eat red meat and butter. So uh, it's a big, long spiel that I draw out. Someday I'll probably do it on a YouTube video or something, but I think it helps because they see me living it. They see me having gone through it, and I did it all without pills. So if I can do it to myself without pills, then I right. have a prescription to help you do it too. So if you, and I have gobs of patients I've gotten reversed their diabetes and gotten them off medications, but not everybody does it. It's not an easy yeah. thing to do in this day and age. It's really inconvenient to eat this way and live this way, but man, it is, it's so much more beneficial. And so, um, I don't know, that's kind of my pitch. I just try to teach them this omega six to three ratio, let them know I've kind of been through it and that I really think uh, if everybody could get their balance closer to what it was, what was an evolutionary ancestral balance that you're going to have, you're going to have better health. How much, so, how, how much of a, just a quick question, yeah. Ryan, how much of a motivator is getting off pills for people? A lot. And the ones that are the best are the ones that are pre-diabetic or like just now getting diagnosed and they're like terrified. And so, you know, I had a guy, he came in his A1C, he, he came in, he wasn't feeling good. I shoot labs on him. All of a sudden, he has an A1C of 13.6. I was like, dude, you are full on diabetic. You That's need, bad. <laughs> you need four. Yeah. I mean, normal's like 5.7, right? So I'm like, you need, you need four pills and you might be on insulin next week. So he's like, I'm not taking anything. And I go, fine. Then if you want to do this, then eat this way. And I, I mean, I, and I, I gave him my, my, my information about how to eat with keto. And because he was a diabetic, I was like, zero, almost zero carbs, man. Right. And he came back six months later, he lost 55 pounds. A1C was 5.3. Blood pressure is normal, but cholesterol looks great. Ratios are fine. And he's like, just ecstatic. Uh, and, and so it can happen. It takes dedication and motivation for patients, but it's, it's but yeah, but I mean, it, it sounds like, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, for me, I talked to Dr. Brett Scher a long time ago. And I said, you know, I have it easy because I'm also gluten intolerant and I have such a severe reaction to gluten. You know, I go partially yeah. blind and I can't talk that it like terrifies right. me to eat it. Right. right. But for, it makes it easy to be compliant when you're afraid, <laughs> yeah. but if you're not, you know, it's a lot harder, I guess for this guy, he was like totally terrified about having to go yeah. onto all these meds. So that was a good motivator. How, how much, how, how do these folks, what's the most effective way for these folks to stay motivated if it's not like they eat, they go off the wagon and they have an immediate bad reaction? Yeah, that's actually what I find the most is if, if they cheat, they'll, they feel like garbage. They'll complain, okay. oh, my joints hurt. My gut hurts. And I know that's my son. I, I didn't eat out for like three years. And I went to, uh, we went to Brazilian buffet. We're like, I'm like, it's all meat. I'll be fine. Oh man, it wasn't. Cause you know, they probably put some kind of oil or something in those. And I woke up at three in the morning screaming and like wanting to puke. 
and wanting to come out of both ends, but neither one would happen. And I just literally laid there for like 30 minutes in the bathroom, just in sheer pain. I'm like, oh, I'm never doing that again. And it's crazy. Right. Right. So I think that's the biggest motivator uh, for people though, is, is if they've done it and they can stick with it for about six months, they notice a couple of things. One, when they cheat, they feel like garbage. And two, if they don't cheat, they don't care what, they don't care about food. Like you're free from this idea of like, what's for lunch? What's the snack? What's for dinner? Like, I don't even, I just I don't even care about food anymore. And that's exciting. But again, it's really hard. I mean, not all my patients will do this. I wish they would. Right. Brian, what, what was your question? So what I'm curious about for, um, for doctors and medical people in general that are encountering this and the folks that are going through it is someone who is able to reverse type two diabetes or or, you know, prevent themselves from getting full-blown diabetes, primarily through a low omega-6, avoiding seed oils. And of course, in a lot of folks doing this, they're going to do a lower carb approach. What I'm curious about is how well do they do with carbs once they're out of the danger zone? Because that is something in terms of the practicality of it and the messaging that I want to make sure that I get right and that I understand better. Because right now, the messaging and my understanding here is that carbs do not cause type two diabetes, but in a sense, you could say carbs plus seed oils. Sure. Would, would bring you to that, to that, um, to that pathology. And when you, part of the messaging is that I want to tell people, but of course I say, this is where I don't know. This is where your mileage may vary. And I want to learn more is, you know, avoid seed oils, get yourself out of the danger zone. And then perhaps you don't have to be keto for the rest of your life, but being seed oil free is something that I, yeah. I look at seed oil, seed oil free is like the, the 80, 20. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's right. why, that's what I start with, with my patients, because what I finally learned after all this is carbs are not really the devil. Okay. And that's what I was frustrated when I learned keto, because they're like, just eat fat, just eat fat, don't eat carbs. Well, okay. But you didn't teach me about soybean oil fat and what that does. So I, I personally eat more carbs now than I used to. Right. And I don't gain weight. Like I, I tell my patients, look, if you can do this and reverse fatty liver disease, then you should reverse the insulin resistance. And then you can add carbs back into your diet, but you can't add back in the American sugar, whole grain and vegetable oils with margarine, or you're just going to go right back to where you were. And so a lot of them, I mean, I have several that have gotten to that point where they've added things back in. I mean, like for myself, I eat anywhere from zero to hundred carbs a day. I just do my best to not eat any sugar or anything with, uh, you know, anything with the, the seed oils. I mean, you're going to get omega-6 in your diet. You can't not, but I just try to keep it as low as humanly possible. Well, I, I also theorize that you probably could since most people are omnivores, let's be honest, right? And most yeah. of our patients will be omnivores. That's just society at whole. Is that I think that you could, there's, if you're avoiding seed oils, you can tolerate a certain level of refined grains and sugar without developing disease, right? And I would say right. that fine grains and sugar, because you, you mentioned the big three in terms of yeah. the big change in our diet in the modern right. era, which is refined grain, sugar, and seed oils. Well, the first two, those are nutrient deficient, right? So as long as you, I think as long as you're getting good nutrients, right? If you're eating bread and you're eating sugar, but you're also eating organ meats and you're eating good, you know, beef or ruminants, um, et cetera, um, I theorize, and I, you know, of course I, you have to, you have to start looking at data to, to really sure. flesh this stuff out, but then, you know, avoiding toxins, <laughs> avoiding seed oils is paramount. Right? right. And, but it gets more, it gets more nuanced with that. And that, that's part of what I've been, what I've been telling people after I go through my spiel and everything is that, you know, I don't think carbs are bad, but you know, there is hope for the future. Right. I, I don't want you to feel guilty about eating a homemade chocolate chip cookie. If you do not have type two diabetes you exactly. know, or, or you're not pre-diabetic, I don't think, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, um, it's a hopeful message for folks. And I think it resonates pretty well. I'm excited yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and yeah, what's, what's important is obviously is that what's happening and that's the one thing, I mean, I've been, that's been my experience, Josh is that I was able, you know, 
to add in carbohydrates and it just doesn't seem to make a difference. I did a rice experiment a couple of years ago and I stopped it out of boredom because it just wasn't making a difference. I do, I will note, feel better on a lower carb diet, which is why I continue it. But for me, that doesn't mean, you know, if, you know, we have a baked potato or we have rice with chili or something, it just doesn't move the needle. And you don't, I don't really get the carbohydrate roller coaster you know, the reactive hyper, well, I mean, they call it, you know, the hangry feeling where you've had a high carb, high seed oil meal. And then a couple hours later, you're just like, you've got shakes. Um, And I used to get that all the time. And it just doesn't, even now when I eat some carbohydrates, you know, a couple hours later, I may feel like a little bit of a craving, but I don't get the shakes. I don't get the reactive feeling, which is enough, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's going to be interesting to come see you tomorrow because yeah. I haven't done an insulin test or I think the last time I did my fasting blood glucose was at keto fest. And that was probably, that was a bunch of years after I changed my diet and it was yeah. finally normal. Because I fasting. was one of- Come fasting I, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no yeah. problem. And we'll um, <laughs> I, you know- So I went, I was one of these people who went keto and I would always have a high fasting glucose, like just, you know, low 100s. And I just kind of figured from what I had heard online that that was kind of typical. And then one day I went to Keto Fest and they were doing free fasting blood glucose and keto tests. And so I did that and it was like, 76 (laughs) on coffee and cream, you know, in the morning. And I was like, dang, because I never saw a number that low when I was seeing my GP regularly. You know, I was never anywhere close to that. So again, it takes, you know, it can take years to fix this stuff. It's not, and that's not to say that you don't start getting the benefits immediately, but it may take, you know, I've lost weight, felt great, everything, all the positives came on immediately but I may not have actually gotten to the point where my body was as healed as it's going to get for, you know, I would say between five and seven years later. Well, and I think I, I, I look at it as like kind of a toxicity spectrum, right? So if your omega-6 ratio is 20 to one, are whole right. grains going to make you sick? Yes. If your omega-6 to ratio is three to one and you want to have some whole grain bread and some peanuts and fine. But right. I think there's this, you know, there's this spectrum. And I, and I, there for a while, I was checking these levels on people. Just, just, I would explain it to them and then they were interested and then I'd show them their number. And I mean, everybody's in the double digits. I only ever had one person have a normal, like it was three to one. And it was the, it was a guy that was doing carnivore for a year and a half. And he was that before was you saw, I never saw three to one, everybody right. else, double digits. I did mine after 10 months of low omega-6 and i was still i think like 8.5 to 1 and i was so mad so i'm waiting i'm going to do it again this november and it'll be a year i want to just see because if i feel this good right now i'm like how much better am i going to feel when that's under five were you able to get insurance to pay for that no but i don't think so it was like 100 bucks <laughs> okay good it wasn't bad just and yeah, i don't know how good of a test hurt. it is i don't know who it came from it's, it's just the one i can get through my office so I'm, I'm kind of interested in trying maybe one that Brad talks about. Omega, so. Omega Quant is the one that was um, the first one, the one that was developed by Bill Harris, who's been pushing the pro Omega-3 message for a long time and was also a consultant for Unilever pushing the seed oils at the same time. So he's got kind of a odd position, <laughs> but whatever. But yeah, supposedly the Omega Quant test is kind of the you know yeah. standard standard test that people do i've seen a bunch of people you know i've seen a bunch of people do that and see their omega-3 numbers go way up when they don't do any supplementation with omega-3 just because they're um cutting back on their seed oils one of the guys who's actually a uh professor of medicine at a at university of california so the message is definitely getting around yeah um So that's really interesting. So what would you say is your, and so what do you do? Okay. What do you do with the folks who aren't interested in doing this? Are, do you see people who come back later on and change their mind or is it generally an either or thing? 
Um, no, so I, I just have this wide range. I'll have some people who do it and there you get to be off their medications. I have some people who halfway do it and, you know, they might just stay stay. And I got some people that just don't do it at all. And for them, all I can do is give them the standard medical practice. Like, oh, well, your blood sugar is 400. You're on six drugs. You just need more insulin if you're not going to eat different. So here you go. And I hate that. And I explained to them, insulin is only going to make you fatter and more insulin resistance. It's like giving an alcoholic more alcohol. Insulin is the worst drug for type two diabetes. Right. But it, some people you just can't motivate and it's tough. Have you ever what? gotten through to any of those people over time? Yeah, a few of the hard, hard ones. And then it's really exciting when they do it. But, you know, and a lot of them, they might be like in their late 70s or 80s and they just don't care. They're like, I'm not going to make an omelet for breakfast, Dr. Durham. I'm going to have cereal right. and oatmeal. And, but, and it's like, okay, you know, so I'm not, I'm not rude to anybody about it. I'm just, I'm excited and passionate about it. And I just tell them like, man, there's a better way if you want to get off this stuff. But I don't know. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, and that's what Dr. Westman said. For, it works all the time, except for people who don't do it. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So, it's hard in this day. One thing I was going to bring up about you saying the munchies thing. This is, a, this is really interesting. So um, when I, I started introducing more carbs back into my diet, I started eating more potatoes. And I would make my kids. Which, which is a law here in Idaho, isn't it? That you have to yeah. have a certain number of potatoes yeah. each year. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I miss potatoes, man. Man, I went three years without a potato. But um, I, uh, I started making my own French fries and beef suet, which is the beef fat. From, right. I, I go to a butcher it's and what, get the It's what Tallow is made from. Yeah. And my kids would eat about four or five of my fries and they'd be like, oh, how come your fries make me so full so fast? But you know, you go to McDonald's and they're like, give me another round of fries. Right. And it would just crack me up because it was so much more satiating. Um, but one time we decided to cheat. We went to this Mexican restaurant and I eat like chips and salsa and you know, whatever. And I paid for it. It, it. it irritated my gut. But the next day I was just craving everything. I hadn't felt like this in three and a half years. And I was just craving anything and everything. And I fasted all day, ate, a, ate like a pound and a half steak for dinner and nothing was satisfying me. It was miserable. So the next day I went and got some uh, like uh, unfinished like corn tortillas, you know, that weren't fried in any oil. And I right. cut those up and made my own chips and fried them in the beef suet and then had a nacho bar. And the next day I was completely full, satisfied, didn't care. It was mind boggling that the difference in the fat did that to me. So, and it's an N of one, I get it. Maybe I'm crazy, but. Well, it's an, really it's, an, it's an N of one with a lot of really good substantiation in the medical and scientific literature. So it's not like you're going yeah. on, out on a limb there. But it's kind of fun because if you, you, you can kind of get, a, if you use the right fat, you can kind of, but yeah, it's a pain in the butt to render fat and do all that, but it's kind of fun. It's kind of neat. Well, we, we just bought, uh, after uh, my wife heard that story, she just bought some beef tallow. She wants to make some French fries now. She's stoked. Oh, you got to figure out how to make them crisp though. You have to, you have to give me that info. You told me you knew a guy that shows you how to do it. I can't make crispy fries. I got to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, it's the, it's the Anthony Bourdain recipe from his uh, La Hall cookbook. You have to double fry him. Um, yeah. And I don't remember the, I can't rattle off the recipe. Yeah, I don't have to go on. look it up again, but boy, those are good. I mean, that was the original McDonald's recipe. Right. That's what I remember that know, as a kid. Yeah. They were great. Yeah. Before they switched over to seed oils. Yeah. So it's wild. I mean, it, it, at the beginning, it was kind of nerve wracking eating all the saturated fat, just thinking, am I really going to kill myself? What's going on here? Uh, but as time gone on, it's fine, but it, it's still nerve wracking doing notes on patients, right? Like, I, 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 if I sit there and, you know, say eat, you know, 200 grams of protein and hundred grams of saturated fat a day, the cardiologists are just going to have a heyday with me. <laughs> so that, that, there's that's kind of ways to document a little differently. You know, you, usually I documented something like uh, discussed anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle <laughs> recommendations. That's and that's what I started doing and say, yeah. and I just, they need to get to a low omega six to three ratio handout given. What does that mean? You know? And yeah. So, right. Your, your honor. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime you're documenting something, just think right. your honor and, uh, and, and you're, and you're good. <laughs> kind of cracks me up. Anyway. Right. Now you're not, uh, do you know what the term, uh, lean mass hyper responder is? Yeah, I do. Okay. Okay. So I'm, that's Dave. I Dave. think I'm partially one of those. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not as my numbers aren't as crazy as Paul, but uh, Paul Saladino, right? Yeah. He's he's definitely a lean mass hyper responder. I, I think my my highest LDL was like 245, but my HDL is like 85, and my triglycerides are like 70. So I I'm not worried about it now. Uh, I mean, initially I was, but I mean, the American Journal of Cardiology in August of 22, 2022. There's a pretty, it's a pretty decent article talking about nutrition and butter and saturated fat. And they kind of, they kind of nonchalantly admitted like, yeah, there's probably nothing wrong with it. We probably should redo the guidelines. And then they talk about the quality of your LDL and the size and, and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I'm, I'm betting based on the way I eat, I have big fluffy LDL, which is why right. I don't stick anymore. Cause it's part of our immune system. Um, you know, uh, well, I mean, you know, even as a doctor, I didn't really understand what LDL was until I went through all this, but that could be a whole nother podcast. But um, I really think it's about the quality of your LDL and two things damage it the most, which is sugar and uh, or excess omega-6 in the diet. And you're going to get sugar glycosylating the LDL receptor, which makes it sticky and damages it. And you're going to have all right. this oxidizing omega-6 in the LDL molecule. Bam. So that's why I say no sugar, no vegetable oils. Well, I got a. I have a. We we can get a little technical here, and Tucker can help help me with this. Um, is the are the dangers of sugar like the the AGEs like you talked about the advanced glycated yeah. end product? Is that downstream of damage done by excess omega six? Like, what what is what is the what's the temporal relationship there? Because um, you know I, you know I I don't think sugar is a complete health food, but I want to. Sure, it's clearly not a health food. Yeah, we we can all agree that anything that rots your face is not a health food. <laughs> but but there but I but it, I think it's important to note the difference between you know sugar and the and carbs in the context of seed oils and carbs and sugar in the context of none, right? And and this is important because I, in terms of the message, in terms of um, uh, people adopting this, right? And 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 what they can expect to get out of it, right? Um, and, you know, so for me, and what I've been doing is I've been doing the the no seed oil diet, right? Um, heavier on red meat. And I'm, you know, I, I still eat sugar like I used to, and my blood pressure is better, and I still lost weight. And, you know, I'm still, you know, I'm not like mainlining, you know, tubes of cookies every day, but, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not zero sugar guy, right? And I'm getting great results from this. But I'm really curious, like what does research show in terms of of damage from sugar intake? What kind of what kind of metabolic derangement are we getting from that without seed oils? I'm just curious what what your take is on that. From uh, what I've seen, seed oils are the primary driver of AGEs. And okay. there's a lot of interaction between you know, I mean, I hate to say it's complicated, but it's complicated. There are <laughs> some of the worst things can be produced from either omega-6 fats or, you know, any polyunsaturated fatty acid or from carbohydrates. So for instance, acrolein, which is one of the worst toxins in cigarette smoke, probably is coming in the cigarette smoke from the fact that they soak tobacco in sugar and then when you burn it, it produces acrolein in the body. Most of the acrolein is coming from omega-6 fats. Um, and acrolein is one of these things that's just like as nasty a thing as you can imagine. The technical term for it is a biocide. It kills any living thing. And the AGEs, same thing. Chris Masterjohn did a great post years ago looking into it. And, you know, my recollection is that about, uh, is that the polyunsaturated fats are about 10 times as effective as carbohydrates and producing advanced glycation end products. I think acroline, is that one that's related to bladder cancer? Because I know there's, there's higher incidence of bladder cancer in people who smoke. Um, and I, I do remember it being a, a board question with it being related to hemorrhagic cystitis. So I'm sure that's- <laughs> Which I've never heard of, but I, it sounds like I don't want to get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Josh, you probably remember that. You know, that's probably some step one question along the way or oh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, one of those things, I, actually- I think it might be some random uh, um, uh, uh, 
oncology question or something too, where, you know, you can increase, increase acroline with this, you know, with this drug, and then it leads to hemorrhagic cystitis. And then, then all of a sudden you're digging around and you're like, oh, that comes from vegetable oil too. That's terrible. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Like, wait a second, you know, um, and I like how you all mentioned um, Chris Masterjohn, you know, he's, he's one of the guys that really got me into this nerdy stuff over a decade ago before I even started med school. And, and the, it sounds funny, but it's true. The punk rock nature of this, I'm a former like metalhead, like uh, not former metalhead, but I'm a former on stage metalhead <laughs> and, and uh, you know, kind of punk rock guy with this stuff. And the fact that I could get into medicine with this, like, forbidden knowledge which had validity was was awesome for me it was definitely a driver you know i'm, I'm not just a, a guy that went to a you know a, a, a state university and then applied to med school like i kind of i i joke that i snuck into the castle <laughs> yeah. um and and it and it still has validity and it but it and it's still not mainstream although we might be able to this might be a good opportunity to talk about lp little a um i'd like to learn from you all um, cause that's well, a new thing that they're, 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 you know, that they're now, um, pushing in terms of educating, um, doctors on what LP little a is and what it means for our patients. And I think there, there's some good tie-ins, um, with that. Yeah. So bef before we go into it, that's a great place to go next, but before we go into yeah. that, I just wanted to point out that the, uh, journal of the American Co college of cardiology paper that. Josh mentioned is titled Saturated Fats and Health, a reassessment and proposal for food-based recommendations. Um, and one of the authors of that is Tom Brenna, who we just interviewed the other day and whose interview will be coming out in a couple of weeks right before yours, Josh. And one of the other interviews, I mean, it's a pretty all-star cast of characters in the author's list of this paper. Um, Jeff Volick, who's the RD behind the Verda Health, is on there. And Ron Kraus, who is the guy who came up with the whole idea of LDL per se not being bad, but it depending on your, you know, are, do you have small, dense LDL or fluffy LDL, um, is the last author, which means he really drove the thing. Um, so yeah, it's, gonna, it's a really interesting paper and it's a good thing given that it comes from, uh, the American college of cardiology is a really good thing to have in your back pocket and to I yeah, presume, I, hand out to patients who yes, are wondering. I about do. This. And I often cite that in my notes that I'm going based on this paper, you know, for CYA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you'll enjoy that interview with Tom Brenner. He's like, he he pulls no punches. Um, nice. Pretty interesting guy. So yeah, LP little a is um, there's some debate about exactly what it does. There's a genetic component to its prevalence in the population, and it's not super clear what that is. And there's also some question as to how it relates to cardiovascular risk. In some populations, it's got a huge relation, like, you know, it increases your hazard ratio by 16.8 is the number I recall, you know, which is on the order of smoking for cardiovascular disease. But in other populations, like in Africa, the, the um, hazard ratio for LP little a is one, it has no effect, zero additional risk. So there's a lot of variance in, of variance in that. Um, what is LP little a? LP little a is a protein that attaches to LDL. And what it does is it collects oxidized omega-6 fat particles, uh, the molecules, you know, that are of omega-6 fat that are oxidized. And also I think, um, proteins can bind to it if they have been damaged by omega-6 fats. So it's been posited that it's a clearance uh, molecule, right? That it's like flypaper going around in your blood and cleaning up all these bad fats, which would be beneficial if you weren't constantly making more of the bad fats. Amusingly enough, there are two surefire ways to raise your LP, little a. One of them is to take statins. And the other one is to go on a low fat, high carbohydrate, quote unquote, healthy diet. <laughs> so, you know, it's, 
Um, another way to low, one way to lower it that I, there's a, uh, I think you mentioned Shabon Huggins before. Um, she was on a pork carnivore diet and had super high LP little a levels. And I recommended to her to try and get off that because of the amount of omega-6 fat in industrial pork. And she did that. And I think cut her LP little a numbers in half in like a couple of weeks. So despite what they say, it is susceptible to dietary modification. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's entirely clear yet how instrumental it is to the disease process or if it's a marker for the disease process you know given that in africans it has no relationship with africans in africa it has no relationship to cardiovascular disease yeah so, i kind of struggled with that too i i my patient who had that uh omega six to three ratio of three to one i did do a uh the uh um lpa test or whatever on him and it was interesting because his was really elevated. And I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. But this is a guy who also works out every day and he does intense workouts and he's a lean responder too. And so I've always, I, so I don't really know, because I, I think exercise can increase it too. Anything that can cause, but cause not in a bad way, right? Like, right. A exercise I, causes I, beneficial inflammation. Right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't want to say that the wrong way, but I think I think what I've learned from it is, is like, you know, part of LDL's job is to get inflammation out of the system. Um, right. And the more inflammation you have, I think the more help, lipoprotein little a you're going to have. I wonder though, you know, like, was this guy's elevated because he just did a crazy hardcore workout, you know, the, the day before. And well, yeah, I, I, I don't know. And if you listen to Dave Feldman, he's kind of like, ah, I don't think it's that big a deal, but I, I so I just don't know. Well, Dave, you know, Dave and I have talked about this. I managed to terrify. I mean, another primary marker of cardiovascular disease inflammation is C-reactive protein, CRP. Right. And, you know, I terrified my old GP once upon a time by coming in for blood tests the morning after I'd run a half marathon without much training and my CRP was through the roof. Sure. And, so that's and what he, I wondered. But that's simply a function, as you said, of exercise, especially right. when you're not trained, you know, you cause a lot of inflammation and the CRP goes up and it's a cleanup process, right? I mean, right. like people, COVID patients with higher CRP levels actually do better because they're processing the inflammation in a healthy way. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a little unclear on the actual um, relationship I have of LP little a to disease process aside from the fact that you're probably better off avoiding, you know, the, ob I mean, the LPA little a test is just a test that's looking for oxidized um, omega-6 fats that have damaged proteins. Okay. Well, right? what, what I'm curious about, and the reason why I bring it up is because uh, American Heart Association is emailing me, a family physician about this. Okay. So in general, how do we communicate the concepts that we're talking about today to folks that are not following our Twitter accounts, the, to the folks that, you know, don't know who Sean Baker or Saladino or Chris Masterjohn are and are just, or, or might have just heard about a seed oil craze or maybe have a friend that tried carnivore, you know, what is the elevator pitch to them? Because we've got, <clears throat> this, another reason why I'm here co-hosting is that I, stumbled upon this huge group of people that are interested in seed oil memes and talking about seed oils and learning more. And so that's, that's a certain level of, of understanding of people. And then we've got Tucker, who's been really in the trenches on this for a long time. And I want to help marry those two. So what do we, you know, what's our opening line? What's our opening salvo? Oh. Like, how do we, how do we talk to people that are on this, this technical side? And I, Tucker, I like how you say now that you know, you're a, you're a, 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 you know, you're a flat earther if you deny this stuff, but what do you bring up first? Like, how do you, where do you well, start? So it's an interesting point. So let's look at what the cardiovascular profession says about LP little a, right? They say it's genetically determined. Typically they don't mention the fact that you can modify it by diet because they're, you know, I mean, the, the paper where they note that the quote unquote healthy diet lowers, raises LP little a, they then do all sorts of gymnastics to explain how increased LP little a is actually beneficial in that context. Um, 
But basically they say, look, it's genetic. You should test once a year. And if it's higher, then all you should do is the stuff that we're going to tell you to do anyway, if you have higher CBD risk. So it doesn't actually, there's no treatment for it. There's, you know, there's, I think the only thing that's been shown to change it is niacin and niacin has been shown to be totally ineffective or right. largely ineffective for cardiovascular disease risk modification or event modification. So, you know, you're not going to do anything about it anyway. So do a healthy diet. And if like somebody like Siobhan, your LP little a numbers come down, then that's a win. But they don't really, they don't have a, they're not particularly saying that you should do anything about it. They don't have any recommendation. They're just saying test for it. Oh, great. But I mean, isn't, isn't rule number one about tests that if the test isn't going to affect your course of treatment, you shouldn't do anything about it. Exactly. You shouldn't do the test. Yeah. If it's not going to change, if it's not leading to a decision, then you're not technically not supposed to do it. Right. So they're telling you to ignore that principle, I guess. Right. I'm curious. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm just curious why, why I'm, you know, do you I mean, why is it at the point where they're like, Hey, you need to know about this. Now the guy who's been really leading this research in the last, you know, couple of decades now, I guess is Sam Samikas. And, um, you know, I follow his work pretty well and follow his Twitter account. And that's kind of the message that I get from him. That's where I'm, you know, and he's done most of the research on this. He's basically taken, you know, so he's just started a company that is um, trying to treat this by producing antibodies, right? Um, against LP little a. I mean, they've noted that people who have antibodies to oxidized, higher levels of antibodies to oxidized LDL tend to have better cardiovascular disease outcomes. So that could theoretically be a therapy for it, but I would get back to, you know, he's following up on the research that was done by Steinberg and Whitstam. They're the guys who discovered ox LDL effectively. And they're the guys who said, hey, higher levels of seed oils make your blood more susceptible to become ox LDL. So it gets us right back to where we started, <laughs> right? If you're really worried about the levels of oxidized omega-6 fats in your blood, which you should be, because it does, you know, apparently initiate cardiovascular disease, um, then fix the problem. Don't try and apply the Band-Aid of antibiotics 20 years down the road, or not antibiotics, antibodies 20 years down the road. And that's, and for folks listening, um, uh, antibody drug development is like the craze. It's there's a lot of money in it. There's a lot of stuff coming out. You've probably seen commercials for this ab or this ab or this, you know, you know, right. and a stands for antibody <laughs> when you, when you name the drug that, and they do great things for people with, um, inflammatory issues and, um, ancestral diets do similar stuff. <laughs> I'd be kind of curious if, if we ever could do a, a randomized trial, it'd be great to see, um, you know, ancestral diets versus, uh, you know, whatever, whatever ab, you know, cause uh, a lot of these drugs, yeah, are, exactly. are, they're, they're working to tune down your immune system. I love when it comes to patient education, I love explaining to people that when you get steroids from your doctor, it means the opposite of what it means on the street. You know, when you're, when you're, when you're on the internet and you're on the street and you joke about steroids, it means muscles bigger. Well, in medicine, steroids mean um, immune system get turned down because what hurts you, you know, physically, <laughs> what causes pain and hurts your body, a lot of times is your own immune system dealing with something. Right. Or overreacting to something. Yeah, exactly. And I right. tell people like, think about a broken ankle. What's a broken ankle? Well, it's red, it's swollen and, and it doesn't work as well. Well, that similar concept is all over your body with, with various degrees is degrees of um, inflammation. And one of the great things about, from, from what I see right now with a no seed oil diet and a low omega-6 diet, which would, um, for, for, for people who are new listeners right now, a low omega-6 diet would be more beef and less chicken and pork. So no seed oils and more, more beef is that people, um, are finding that they have lower levels of inflammation all over their body. Right. And I was, uh, it was, it was a huge compliment in terms of this, this guideline and this, in this perspective to hear from someone like Rob Wolf that we interviewed not too long ago, 
um, who's a, a, an OG in the paleo ancestral health world, saying that the stories that he's hearing for people who are, who are paying attention to this knob, this being able to titrate, be able to turn down their omega-6, the stories he's hearing reminds him of the beginning of talking about paleo. So right. people are getting the success turning down their omega-6. And so it's, it's, it's like almost throttling inflammation. Let's get rid of some inflammation. Let's, and pick an organ system, skin, eczema, um, you know, GI, IBS, or, or even IBD, you know, Crohn's and colitis or thyroid issues, or it just, you could throttle it down, it, it seems. And that's, that's, it's amazing. It, it's amazing to be able to. I have a personal story about that. So before yeah. I learned keto and all this, I had plantar fasciitis for like two and a half years. I had it on my elbow. I gave myself cortisone shots. Oh God. And um, I mean, it was bad. <laughs> started on that. Yeah, it was bad. Um, and then as I learned this and got better, of course that I don't, I don't, I don't get tendonitis anymore. I remember reading something somewhere and I don't, and you can tell me if this is true or not, but like the old pig farmers knew that if you fed the pigs too much soybean that their muscles and tendons would actually just rupture because you can't if you overdo it or something and it made there's me a disease it. in chickens called wooden breast syndrome and basically what it is in chickens that they're raising for food and basically what it is is uh fibrosis in the breast muscle muscle where the it becomes like wood so yeah eat foods that make that happen to your body what a great idea right. okay that's, that's yeah. insane <laughs> isn't that isn't that insane i read about that i was like horrified i spent a whole day on that topic it was like this is this is the grossest thing i've ever heard of so and i mean you know it gets it, you know it gets back to you go through the literature and the whole i mean hne the you know one of the primary oxidative breakdown products of linoleic acid induces fibrosis in the body it's a it's a well-known cause of fibrosis in the body in every organ system. So that's one of the areas where, as far as I'm concerned, there's, it's one of the more open and closed cases that this is causative of a disease process. Well, that is, that is a great segue into talking about um, Omega Initiative. The, <laughs> yes, no, it is, it's great. You're and so I'm, good at this stuff, Brian. Oh you, never, you, ne you never fail to bring that up. Uh, well, I, that's because that's because I'm pushing you because we got paperwork to finish, I guess. Yep. <laughs> so Omega Initiative is um, uh, will be a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It will um, highlight, aggregate, and eventually advance research pertaining to polyunsaturated fat, right? Because you, you can't discuss omega six without you know omega three being in there too. And and I I bring this up now because you just mentioned HNE, what's that hydroxynonanol? Is that how you yeah. say it? Yep. And the fact that it's related to fibrosis and you can name an organ system basically. So that's a great example of something that Omega Initiative would be able to do is help aggregate this and say, look, you've got this significant physiological, pathophysiological um, uh, consequence of high levels of omega-6 in your body. And look, it is related to pulmonology. It is related to dermatology. It is related to, and that's important because so much of medicine is regimented, you know, and, the, and siloed you're talking to that hand. And, yeah. and, and, you know, if you're talking about scleroderma or pulmonary fibrosis and restrictive lung diseases, you know, this or is arthr or arthritis. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for that to get to someone, you know, to get to a family medicine doctor, you know, this is, this is important. So, you know, I, I don't think we, we, I don't think we've talked about fibrosis yet, Tucker, but that's just another thing, another, another check box, yeah. you know, and, um, and I don't know if we, well, we told uh, Dr. Durham about that yet, but, you know, we wanted. Um, well, I mean, know, as Josh said, he went through and started looking at it and he's like, everything's related to this. Yeah. I mean, every one of these chronic diseases is, is mechanistically related to this and of course epidemiologically related to it because none of them exist in populations that don't eat industrial seed oils yeah i mean i just try to paint it as a logical picture to my patients you know let me drop you off in the middle of africa and go live with some of these indigenous tribes and see what happens see what they're eating they eat normal omega-6 to 3 ratio diets yeah you know one of the one of the more remarkable stories i heard was from the um uh, 
trainer at the company I worked for a bunch of years ago in New York and his mother was diabetic and on insulin and he was from Ghana. Um, I think he was, I forget his background, but anyway, he was, uh, grew up in Ghana and, but was an American citizen. And we were talking about diet stuff, you know, in the course of working out in the gym. And he said, oh yeah, no, every time my mom goes back home to Ghana, she has to stop her insulin because her <laughs> diabetes goes away. And then she comes back to New York and she has to go back on the insulin because the diabetes comes back. I mean, just unbelievable. And they don't eat, you know, he was an interesting guy because he couldn't figure out how sugar could possibly cause bad cause tooth decay because he grew up eating sugar cane and he had a set of the most beautiful teeth I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, and it was just probably because he had the back grew up in the background of a healthy diet and it was a high carb diet. The Ghanaians are not all keto or anything and they're not avoiding sugar. They're eating sugar cane and they're eating a lot of, you know, whatever their grains are, but they're probably on a low, you know, industrial food diet just because they're poor. It's so, incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so let's see, we should probably um, start winding up. Uh, Josh, so what's your, so what's your, what's your takeaway from all this with your practice? You know, I just try to break it down and make it as logic as possible to patients. You know, you, I tell them, look, you've got a disease. You have too much sugar and the wrong kind of fat in your blood. So stop eating it. Right. So that's, right. The, that's the thing that bothers me is in America, it's like, okay, you have diabetes, you have a disease where you have too much sugar in your blood. Why are we telling you to eat anything that raises your blood sugar? It's poison for you. Right. It may not be poison for somebody who's metabolically healthy, but for a diabetic. Yeah. Why are you eating carbs? Sorry, you shouldn't. And then, uh, you know, so what, so my takeaway is just trying to be logical with people, getting to realize what's more of an ancestral diet. I mean, we ate meat. We ate uh, ruminants. We ate saturated fat for thousands of generations. I just personally don't believe that it's the butter and the red meat that's making us all sick. Suddenly. Yeah, all of a sudden. Uh, it just doesn't, it just, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I just know doing what I did with my own health and helping a lot of my patients do the same, I've seen amazing results. And in a perfect world, that's where I would see my entire practice going to is just trying to teach people how to do this because I get to de-prescribe medications. I mean, I had a guy come in, he, he was on two liters of oxygen. Right, yeah, I wanted and, you to uh, tell this story. Yeah, two liters of oxygen, he's 65 years old, he's got horrible sleep apnea and he's falling asleep while I'm talking to him. And he's got bad diabetes and he's on like 15 different drugs. And I just looked at him, I was like, and I was blunt with him and he's been my patient for three or four years. I was like, dude, you're going to die. You, you, you need to change your diet or you're just not going to make it. And he goes, well, what should I do? And I said, I tried to teach him keto and all this before. And it was just too hard for him. So I said, just eat meat, meat and eggs. Come back, just eat meat and eggs. <laughs> he came back in three months. He didn't have his oxygen on. And he'd lost, I think, like 30 or 40 pounds. And I looked at him and I was like, who are you? And I was like, what did you do? And he goes, oh, I just started eating meat, like you said. And after a month, I felt so good, I kept doing it. So then he comes back a year later and he walks in. And I mean, the guy looks amazing. And he's like, I'm back to doing construction with my, on my brother's house. And he takes these two bags of medicine and he just drops them all. And he says, I just wanted you to know, I'm not taking any of these anymore. And I haven't for a few months. His labs are all normal and he got his life back. And he's just like, I just eat meat. <laughs> he's added awesome. some other stuff, you know, but he's. It's, so he is, he is adding stuff back in. Yeah. Just, so, I mean, he's just, but he's avoiding the seed oils and the, and the excess grains. And it's like, yes. And so that's like, that's what keeps me going every day. And, and hopefully as you get going on in your career and you've helped this, and then you see this awesome snowball effect because somebody inherently sees that that's their friend or family says, well, what the hell did you do? And right. this is how your wife found me. Well, because so-and-so told me and so-and-so told me, and then all of a sudden, boom, you've got, I mean, I've got patients who've got 10 family members with the same kind of story 
all because they learned it from me. And that's great. I don't care. I just want people to be healthy and get it. It's, it's just exciting. That's amazing. I mean, there's literally no way in using standard medicine, you'd get somebody off oxygen. No, it was, it was crazy. That is amazing. Yeah. That's really amazing. And they're not all that great a story. I mean, that's like, right. You know, that's home run yeah, but or still, grand slam, but, but that tells you what's possible. Yeah. It was, but it, it takes self-discipline and it takes work and it takes educating and uh, it's tough. Right. Right. Have well, you, what are your, one last question here. What are yeah. your, what do your peers think of this? Yeah. You know, I mean, you're, you've got patients who are, you know, also seeing specialists. Right. And initially, I presume uh, you two are, t- you guys talk to each other periodically. Yeah. Initially, the cardiologists were really like, uh uh-uh, uh, what are you doing? You know, you're going to kill everyone. Yeah. But um, more and more, they're starting to come around and not be as bad. I have patients, I have uh, partners that send me patients for it because they, they know. I know how to do it, but, and they just haven't taken the time to get the level of understanding to teach people how to do it. And okay. like, they totally get it. And they've seen the results. It's funny. I'm actually the diabetes director for St. Alphonsus and I'm over the diabetes clinics, but none of them practice the same way I do for diabetes. And so my message is cure it. And the problem in America is just manage it. And I just, managing is a slow, miserable death. It doesn't need to happen. Do you, I mean, do you see a path where you could change? Because I know um, Mark Cucuzella, who's a family doc down in West Virginia, um, a pretty amazing guy, uh, and he's gotten his whole hospital. It's a small hospital, but he's gotten his whole hospital to change diabetes treatment. And he's seeing success. And it's not only with, you know, it's not only with the patients, but the staff, because obesity, Oh yeah, I would guess registered nurses on average are probably the most overweight group of americans and i you know i'm sure i'll get slapped around by my wife for saying that but um you know getting the staff to figure it out and getting the pay getting them to say okay this work this actually works it worked for dr durham and i tried it and it worked for me and we have to start doing this for the patients i mean have you what do you what do you think the path towards that i don't know i I've, I've tried to bring it up and, and, uh, I did, I've gone to a meeting before and given a little presentation on keto, although that was before that was kind of more at the beginning where I don't know, have the knowledge that I have now. So right. it's something that's kind of been like hitting me in the stomach, like, come on, you need to go and do it again, but now do it with the new information and really show some examples and show, you know, logically, that's my whole thing. I just try to hit it logically, like logically, you guys are really good about the whole sciencey this and that and, <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. i'm like trying to do it sciencey or i mean logical like cow chow predator chow like if right. you want to make a cow fat grain corn and soy you want to make if you want to make a lion fat feed it the same thing like all of our dogs and our cats are sick and fat with diabetes why because we're feeding the same crap right it just happens to us too but I, I there is this part of me that wants to try to revamp the whole system i just i just don't know how to you know change everybody's mind that's the hardest thing it's like it's like politics and religion it's like this has been fed into you from right. everything you've ever learned so that tell a registered dietitian like sorry whole grains are just not it anymore <laughs> they're you just know, gonna I'm, look at me like i'm crazy their right. entire curriculum is is bureaucratic you know the entire world of nutrition right education you know so i respectively say I disagree with your school. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's, no, not it's not their fault. I mean, I used to, this is not personal at all. Yeah, I used to say the same stuff. It's not their fault. It's just when I listened to that, I got sick. Right. When I did the opposite, I got better. I, I, I'm biased. What can I say? <laughs> right. Well, yeah. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to is, you know, what works. And right. clearly for diabetes, what doesn't work is the standard of care. Right. I don't think you know, Kaiser Permanente years ago did a huge study of the possibility of diabetes remission. And you were, I think, you know, roughly more likely to get struck by lightning sitting inside your house than to go into remission. And then Verta Health came out and had a super high rate. And all of a sudden, oh, wow, you can put diabetes into remission. It's not progressive. Whoops, we've been right. wrong for the last 80 years. Yeah, it's amazing. And, it, and so that's why if anybody's listening, if you think, 
uh, you know, if you think oh, I'm crazy, try it, try it on yourself, try it on a patient. If right. People are doing it all over the world. I remember the first time I heard somebody do it, I was like, ah, that's not possible. Even my brother was telling me about this keto thing before all this. And I was like, no, that doesn't sound good, man. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, I used to tell people that too. Yeah. I used to, now you know, I used to tell people, so, somebody once told me she was on Atkins and I was like, you're going to kill yourself. Yeah. Well, I want people to note, especially since we're spending a lot of time talking about diabetes here, I'd love to do another one on heart disease. Uh, but from the, the medical establishment's point of view, you're on XYZ medicines for diabetes and you get that A1C under seven, they're going to document and tell you that your diabetes is under control. Right. And yes. with a lot of doctors, they'll say, looks good. We don't need to change your medicines anymore. Okay. And that is for a lot of folks, the end of the story. Next, what else we have going down? And if you're dealing with a population that is not you know, uh, doesn't know about what we're talking about in terms of how to cure diabetes, type two diabetes. Um, uh, and, and to be clear, we're talking about type two, not like a complete lack of, you know, beta cells, you know, with the yeah, type, know, type one diabetes is a completely different disease. Exactly. So um, primary prevention, you know, just not completely cure it. So you don't have it at all. So there's a difference there. And we need to bring primary prevention back to primary care. Right. That's, Can I, that's, that's a good I, sound. I want to extrapolate just a tiny bit on what you just said. So I, I tell my patients when they come in and they're A1C 6.5, they're on three drugs, they're on a statin, they're on blood pressure medicine, their blood pressure is good, their cholesterol looks good. I look at them in the face and I say, These, they're just making your labs look good. Yeah. You are good. still sick. You are right. still rotting. You still have oxidative damage going on in your body. You still are clogging your arteries. We're just helping you slow it down. So I, tell, I, don't, I don't tell them, good job. Hey, yeah. I, I, I say when you're off your medicines and your A1C is normal and your cholesterol looks healthy and your blood pressure is healthy, that's when we stop. That's right. like, so so that's, that was the big change that happened for me too because I was like, oh, I'm meeting all my quotas. Their blood pressure is great. They're on six pills. I'm out the door. See you later. Now every patient takes longer because I want them to understand this is like the Wizard of Oz. There's something behind the curtain. Your labs look good, but that's, that should not make you feel confident. You are still sick. So I right. think that, that's like the biggest message we need to get to our colleagues. And in terms of billing, you know, uncontrolled bills is higher than controlled, sure. right? So <laughs> and that's, that's and I tell all my pre-diabetics, you are that. It doesn't right. matter. Okay, this has been great. I think this is going to be super helpful, both to patients and also hopefully to any uh, physicians who watch this, because I think it's, you know, seeing it done in practice and seeing that this one little aspect of it can make such a big difference. I mean, you're doing multiple interventions with people, but for yourself, for both of you guys, you know, Brian getting rid of his hypertension and you changing your body composition so dramatically, just basically from changing one variable. I think making making folks realize that this is the controlling variable is going to be really revolutionize things because it does make it it makes the intervention a lot simpler for a lot of people, I think. Because it boils and, down to junk food, right? Right. Yep. Yeah, I, okay. I say that a lot of people are one step or two steps away from understanding exactly what we're talking about because they agree processed junk food's bad, fried food's bad, right? You just yeah. Okay. So what's the ingredient of those two things? <laughs> right. What's the common variable? Exactly. So, uh, Dr. Durham, thank you so much for your yeah. time. It's been great. I'll see you in the you. morning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And Brian, thanks again. It's, it's been terrific. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Brian.